Stephen Bartlett. The Dairy of a CEO. The 33 Laws of Business and Life. Dedicated to everyone that listens to and watches. The Diary of a CEO. Thank you for allowing us to live the greatest dream we never had. Introduction. Who am I to write this book? I've been the CEO, founder, co-founder or board member of four industry-leading companies that collectively, at their peaks, reached a cumulative valuation of more than $1 billion. I'm currently the founder of Flight Story, an innovative marketing agency, Third Web, a software company, and an investment fund called Flight Fund. My companies have employed thousands of people in every corner of the world. I've raised almost $100 million of investment for my companies. I'm an investor in more than 40 companies. I'm on the board of four companies, two of which are currently at the forefront of their respective industries, and I'm 30 years old. Being the founder of two successful marketing groups that have risen to the top of their industry, within their market, has meant that I spend much of my professional life in boardrooms working with and advising the CEOs, CMOs, and leaders of the biggest brands in the world on how to do marketing and how to tell their story online, Uber, Apple, Coca-Cola, Nike, Amazon, TikTok, Logitech, you name it, they have been my clients. Additionally, I've spent the last four years interviewing the world's most successful individuals from business, sports, entertainment, and academia. I have 700 hours of recordings where I've interviewed your favorite authors, actors, and CMOs, the world's leading neuroscientists, the captain of your favorite sports team, the manager of your favorite sports team, the CEOs of the billion-dollar companies you use every day, and more of the world's leading psychologists than I could possibly name. I published these conversations in the form of a podcast called The Diary of a CEO, and that podcast quickly became the most downloaded podcast here in Europe and one of the top business podcasts in the USA, Ireland, Australia, and the Middle East. It is arguably one of the fastest-growing podcasts in the world right now, increasing its listenership by 8.25% last year alone. I've been lucky enough to be exposed to some unique experiences, and a few years ago it dawned on me how much valuable and powerful information I've gained, and only a handful of people on earth have access to that information. I also realized that at the very heart of all the success and failure I've seen, both in my own entrepreneurial journey and the hundreds of interviews I've conducted, were a set of laws that could stand the test of time, transfer to any industry, and be used by anyone who is trying to build something great or become someone great. This is not a book about business strategy. Strategy changes like the seasons. This is a book about something much more permanent. This is a book about the fundamental, enduring laws of building great things and becoming great yourself. These laws can be used by anyone, regardless of your industry or occupation. These laws will work now or 100 years from now. These laws are rooted in psychology, science, and centuries of research, and to further validate these laws I surveyed tens of thousands of people across every continent, every age group and every profession. The design of this book is based on five core beliefs. I believe most books are longer than they need to be. I believe most books are more complicated than they need to be. I believe pictures paint a thousand words. I believe stories are more powerful than that but both are important. I believe in nuance and that the truth is often somewhere in the middle. In short, it aims to embody a quote often attributed to Einstein. Everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. To me, this means giving you the fundamental truth and understanding of each law, in the exact number of words necessary to do so, no less, no more, and using powerful imagery and incredible real stories to bring the key points to life. The Four Pillars of Greatness Becoming great, and building great things, requires mastery within four pillars. I call these the four pillars of greatness. Pillar I, the self. As Leonardo da Vinci asserted, one can have no smaller or greater mastery than mastery of oneself, you will never have a greater or lesser dominion than that over yourself, the height of your success is gauged by your self-mastery, the depth of your failure by your self-abandonment. Those who cannot establish dominion over themselves will have no dominion over others. This pillar is about you. Your self-awareness, self-control, self-care, self-conduct, self-esteem, and self-story. The self is the only thing we have direct control over, to master it, which is no easy task, 
is to master your entire world. Pillar 2, The Story Everything that stands in your way is a human. Science, psychology, and history have shown that there is no graph, data or information that stands a greater chance of positively influencing those humans than a truly great story. Stories are the single most powerful weapon any leader can arm themselves with, they are the currency of humanity. Those who tell captivating, inspiring, emotional stories rule the world. This pillar is about storytelling and how to harness the laws of storytelling to persuade the humans that stand in your way to follow you, to buy from you, to believe you, to trust you, to click, to act, to hear you and to understand you. Pillar 3, The Philosophy In business, sports, and academia, an individual's personal philosophies are the single biggest predictors of how they'll behave, now and in the future, if you know someone's philosophy or beliefs, you can accurately forecast how they'll behave in any situation. This pillar is about the personal and professional philosophies that great people believe and live by and how those philosophies result in behavior that leads to greatness. Your philosophy is the set of beliefs, values, or principles that guide your behavior, they are the fundamental beliefs that underpin your actions. Pillar 4, The Team The definition of the word company is, group of people, at its essence, every company, project, or organization is just a group of people. Everything the organization produces, good or bad, originates from the minds of the members of your group of people. The most important success factor in your work is who you choose to work with. I've never seen anyone build a great company, project, or organization without a group of people, and I've never seen anyone reach personal greatness without the support of a group of people. This pillar is about how to assemble and get the best out of your group of people. Assembling any group of people is not enough, for your group of people to become a truly great team, you need the right people, bound together by the right culture. When you have great people bound by a great culture, the whole team becomes greater than the sum of its parts. When 1 plus 1 equals 3, great things happen. Pillar I The Self Law 1 Fill your 5 buckets in the right order. This law explains the five buckets that determine your human potential, how to fill them and, crucially, in which order you should fill them. My friend David was in the front garden of his home, enjoying his morning espresso, as a sweaty, confused-looking, panting man in tired gym attire jogged towards him slowly. The jogging man paused in his stride and greeted my friend David as he struggled to catch his breath. He cracked an unintelligible joke, appeared to laugh frantically at it then began erratically talking about the spaceship he was building, the microchips he was going to put in monkeys' brains, and the AI-powered house robots he was going to create. Moments later, the jogging man said goodbye to David, and continued his slow, sweaty trudge down the street. That sweaty jogging man was Elon Musk. Billionaire founder of Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, OpenAI, PayPal, Zip2 and The Boring Company. Before I revealed the identity of the sweaty jogging man, you may have understandably assumed he was an escapee of the local psychiatric facility, or suffering from some psychotic break. But once you heard his name, all those extraordinary aforementioned ambitions suddenly became believable. So believable, in fact, that when Elon tells the world of his ambitions, people will blindly give billions of dollars of their children's inheritance to back him, they'll quit their jobs and relocate to work for him and they'll pre-order his products before he's even created them. This is because Elon has filled his five buckets, in fact all of the people I've met that possess the power to build truly great things have five brimming buckets. The sum of these five buckets is the sum of your professional potential. The fullness of these buckets will determine how big, believable, and achievable your dreams are to you, and to those that hear them. Those that achieve great things have spent years, often decades, pouring into these five buckets. Someone fortunate enough to have five full buckets has all the potential needed to change the world. When you're seeking employment, selecting the next book you want to read or deciding what dream to pursue, you must be aware of how full your buckets are. The five buckets. What you know, your knowledge. What you can do, your skills. Who you know, your network. What you have, your resources. What the world thinks of you, your reputation. At the start of my career, as an 18-year-old startup founder, I was haunted by a moral question that I couldn't seem to shake, is focusing my time and energy on building a company, which would ultimately enrich me, 
a more noble pursuit than going back to where I was born in Africa and investing my time and energy in saving even one life. This question remained at the front of my mind for several years until one chance encounter in New York granted me some much needed clarity. I attended an event hosted by Radhanath Swami, a world-renowned guru, monk, and spiritual leader, at an event he was holding in New York. As I squeezed in among a sea of the Swami's mesmerized followers, who were starry-eyed and hanging on to his every word in a perfectly still, appreciative silence, the guru asked if anyone in the crowd had a question for him. I raised my hand. The guru gestured at me to deliver my question. I asked, is building a business, and enriching myself, a more noble pursuit than going back to Africa to try and save lives? The guru stared at me as if he could see into the depths of my soul, and after a long, blinkless pause he proclaimed, you cannot pour from empty buckets. Almost a decade on from that moment, it's never been clearer what the guru meant. He was telling me to focus on filling my own buckets, because someone with full buckets can positively bend the world in any way he or she desires. Having now built several large companies, worked with the biggest organizations in the world, become a multimillionaire, managed thousands of people, read hundreds of books and spent 700 hours interviewing the world's most successful people, my buckets are sufficiently full. Because of this, I now possess the knowledge, skills, network, resources, and reputation to help millions of people all over the world, which is exactly what I intend to spend the rest of my life doing, through my philanthropic work, the donations I make, the organizations I create, the media companies I build and the school I'm working to launch. These five buckets are interconnected, filling one helps to fill another, and they are generally filled in order from left to right. We usually start our professional life acquiring knowledge, school, university, etc., and when this knowledge is applied, we call it a skill. When you have knowledge and skills you become professionally valuable to others and your network grows. Consequently, when you have knowledge, skills, and a network, your access to resources expands, and once you have knowledge, skills, a valuable network and resources, you will undoubtedly earn a reputation. With these five buckets and their interconnected relationship in mind, it's clear that an investment in the first bucket, knowledge, is the highest yielding investment you can make. Because when that knowledge is applied, skill, it inevitably cascades to fill your remaining buckets. If you truly understand this, you'll understand that a job that pays you slightly more cash, resources, but gives you far less knowledge and fewer skills, is a lower paying job. The force that clouds our ability to act upon this logic is usually ego. Our ego has an incredible ability to persuade us to skip the first two buckets, convincing us to take a job simply for more money, bucket 4, or a job title, status, or reputation, bucket 5, without the knowledge, bucket 1, or skills, bucket 2, to succeed in that role. When we succumb to this temptation, we're building our career on weak foundations. These short-term decisions, your inability to delay your gratification, be patient, and invest in your first two buckets, will ultimately catch up with you. In 2017, a very talented 21-year-old employee called Richard walked into my office and told me he had some news to share with me. He told me that he had been offered a job as CEO of a new marketing company halfway across the world, and that he wanted to leave my company, where he had been flourishing, to take it. He told me the role offered him an enormous pay rise, almost double what we paid him, an equity package and a chance to live in New York City, a far cry from the dreary village he was raised in and an apparent step up from Manchester, England, where he worked for my company. To be totally frank, I didn't believe him. I couldn't fathom that a legitimate business would offer a junior employee, with no management experience, such a prominent role. Nonetheless, I accepted his claims and told him that we would support him in his transition out of our company. It turns out I was wrong, Richard was telling the truth. The job offer did exist and a month later he became CEO of the company, moved to New York and started his new life as a C-suite executive in the Big Apple, leading a team of more than 20 people, in a rapidly growing marketing startup. Unfortunately, that is not where the story ends, as life would come to teach both me and Richard, there is no skipping the first two buckets of knowledge and skills if you're playing for long-term, sustainable results. Any attempt to do so is equivalent to building your house on sand. Within 18 months, the once promising company Richard had joined had gone under, lost its key employees, 
run out of money and become shrouded in controversy relating to management practices. After the company closed, Richard was unemployed, far from home, and searching for a new, more junior role, in the same industry that we had employed him in. When deciding which path to take in life, which job to accept or where to invest your spare time, remember that knowledge, when applied, skill, is power. Priorities filling those first two buckets and your foundations will have the long-term sustainability you need to prevail, regardless of how life's tectonic plates move and shake beneath you. I define a professional earthquake as an unpredictable career event that adversely impacts you. This could be anything, a technological innovation that disrupts your whole industry, being fired by your employer, or if you're a founder, your company going under. There are only two buckets that any such professional earthquake can never empty, it can take away your network, it can take your resources, it can even impact your reputation, but it can never remove your knowledge and it can never unlearn your skills. These first two buckets are your longevity, your foundation, and the clearest predictor of your future. The law, fill your five buckets in the right order. Applied knowledge is skill, and the more you can expand and apply your knowledge, the more value you'll create in the world. This value will be repaid in a growing network, abundant resources, and a robust reputation. Make sure you fill your buckets in the right order. Those who hoard gold have riches for a moment. Those who hoard knowledge and skills have riches for a lifetime. True prosperity is what you know and what you can do. Law 2. To master it, you must create an obligation to teach it. This law explains the simple technique that the world's most renowned intellectuals, authors, and philosophers used to become the masters of their craft and how you can use it to develop any skill, master any topic and build an audience. The story. It felt like the entire population of planet Earth had gathered to watch me melt on stage that evening, but in reality, it was just a handful of my fellow secondary school pupils, their parents, and a few teachers. I was 14 years old and had been tasked with saying a few closing remarks at my school's exam awards evening. As I walked out onto the stage, the auditorium fell into an anticipatory silence. And there I stood, frozen, terrified, and mute for one of the longest minutes anyone has ever endured, staring down at the trembling piece of paper clasped between my clammy, nervous hands, on the verge of urinating into my own underwear, experiencing what people refer to as stage fright. The script I had planned to deliver was shaking with such ferocity that I couldn't see the words. Eventually I blurted out some improvised, cliched, nonsensical remarks before darting off stage and out of the door as if I were being followed by a firing squad. Fast forward 10 years from that traumatic day and I'm speaking on stage 50 weeks a year in every corner of the globe, I'm headlining alongside Barack Obama in front of tens of thousands in Sao Paulo, I'm speaking in sold-out arenas in Barcelona, I'm touring the UK and speaking at festivals from Kiev to Texas to Milan. The Explanation I went from being a train wreck of a public speaker, to rubbing shoulders with some of the very best to ever do it, and there is one simple law that I credit with this transformation. This law is not just responsible for my onstage composure, performance, and delivery, my skills, it's also the reason why I have something interesting to share while I'm on stage, my knowledge. I created an obligation to teach. The late spiritual leader Yogi Bhajan once said, if you want to learn something, read about it. If you want to understand something, write about it. If you want to master something, teach it. At 21 years old, I made a promise to myself that every day at 7 p.m., I would write a tweet or make a video delivering a single idea, and then post it online at 8 p.m. Of all the things I've done in my life to advance my knowledge and skills, to fill my first two buckets, this is the thing that made the most difference. It's no exaggeration to say that it has completely changed the trajectory of my life, and consequently it's the piece of advice I urge most strongly upon anyone looking to become a better thinker, speaker, writer, or content creator. The key factor here is that I made learning, then writing slash recording and sharing it online, a daily obligation, not just an interest. Skin in the game. Soon after creating this obligation, I got feedback in the form of comments from my audience and analytics from the social platforms, this helped me to improve, and in turn, created a community of people that were following me purely for this daily idea. This started as tens of people and almost 10 years later that community has grown to almost 10 million followers across all channels. From the first idea I shared, 
I created a social contract with my audience, essentially a social obligation to the people who were following me specifically for this daily idea, which motivated me to continue posting and gave me something to lose, their attention and my reputation, if I stopped. Having something to lose is fundamentally what an obligation is, and having something to lose is sometimes referred to as having skin in the game. Skin in the game is an important psychological tool to harness if you want to accelerate your learning curve in any area of your life. Having skin in the game raises the stakes of your learning by building deeper psychological incentives to perform a behavior. The skin can be anything from money to a personal public commitment. You want to learn more about a specific company? Buy a few shares of the stock. You want to learn about Web 3.0? Buy an NFT. If you want to be consistent in the gym, Make a WhatsApp group with your friends where you share your workouts every day. In these three examples, either monetary or social currency is at stake. Skin in the game works because across several global studies it's been demonstrated that human behavior is more strongly driven by the motivation to avoid losses than to pursue gains, which is what scientists call loss aversion. Give yourself something to lose. The Feynman Technique Revised So. If you want to master something, do it publicly and do it consistently. Publishing your written ideas forces you to learn more often and to write more clearly. Publishing a video forces you to improve your speaking skills and to articulate your thoughts. Sharing your ideas on stage teaches you how to hold an audience and tell captivating stories. In any area of your life, doing it in public, and creating an obligation that forces you to do it consistently, will lead you to mastery. One of the most valuable elements of this obligation was having to distill any idea I wanted to share down to its 140 character essence, so that it could fit within the constraints of a tweet. Being able to simplify an idea and successfully share it with others is both the path to understanding it and the proof that you do. One of the ways we mask our lack of understanding of any idea is by using more words, bigger words, and less necessary words. This challenge of simplifying an idea to its essence is often referred to as the Feynman Technique, named after the renowned American scientist Richard Feynman. Feynman won a Nobel Prize in 1965 for his groundbreaking work in quantum electrodynamics. He had a gift for explaining the most complex, baffling ideas in simple language that even a child could understand. I couldn't reduce it to the freshman level. That means we really don't understand it. Richard Feynman the Feynman Technique is a powerful mental model for self-development. It forces you to strip away unnecessary complexity, distill a concept to its purest essence, and develop a rich, in-depth understanding of whatever discipline you seek to master. The Feynman Technique follows a few key steps, which I've simplified and updated based on my own learning experience. Step 1. Learn. First you must identify the topic you want to understand, Research it thoroughly and grasp it from every direction. Step 2. Teach it to a child. Secondly, you should write the idea down as if you were teaching it to a child, use simple words, fewer words, and simple concepts. Step 3. Share it. Convey your idea to others, post it online, post it on your blog, share it on stage or even at the dinner table. Choose any medium where you'll get clear feedback. Step 4. Review. Review the feedback, did people understand the concept from your explanation? Can they explain it to you after you've explained it to them? If not, go back to step 1, if they did, move on. As we look over history, this is the one thing that every great speaker, renowned author, and prominent intellectual I've ever encountered or interviewed has in common. When Prospect Magazine released their list of the top 100 modern intellectuals, every name on the list followed this law. When I researched the preeminent philosophers from history, every single one of them embodied and were often staunch advocates of this law. At some point in their life, through intention, or accident, they had created an obligation to think, write, and share their ideas, consistently. Whether it's leading modern authors like James Clear, Malcolm Gladwell or Simon Sinek who write tweets, online blogs, and create social media videos, or ancient philosophers like Aristotle, Plato, and Confucius, who wrote on papyrus scrolls and spoke on stages, they all abide by this crucial law, all of them have created an obligation to teach, and in turn they've become masters of both knowledge and delivery. The person who learns the most in any classroom is the teacher. James Clear The law, to master it, 
you must create an obligation to teach it. Learn more, simplify more and share more. Your consistency will further your progress, the feedback will refine your skill and following this law will lead to mastery. You don't become a master because you are able to retain knowledge. You become a master when you are able to release it. Law 3. You must never disagree. This law will make you a master of communication, negotiation, conflict resolution, winning arguments, being heard and changing people's minds. It also explains why most of your arguments are never productive. The story. For most of my childhood I witnessed my mother shouting heatedly at my father as he sat watching TV, apparently completely oblivious to her presence. These ear-piercing screaming marathons were like nothing I'd ever witnessed before and nothing I've witnessed since. She could shout at him for five or six hours, about the same thing, using the same words, without any apparent reduction in volume or enthusiasm. On occasion, my father might try and argue back for a brief moment, and when he inevitably failed to land his rebuttal, he would either continue to ignore her or flee to another part of the house, lock himself in his bedroom, or jump in the car and drive off. It took me 20 years to realize that I'd learned this exact conflict resolution strategy from him, while I was lying in bed at 2 a.m. as my angry girlfriend badgered me, on repeat, about something she was unhappy about. I rebutted her with, I disagree, and attempted to make a convincing counter-argument. Needless to say, I failed. Like throwing petrol onto a bonfire, she carried on shouting at me with increased volume, making the same point, using the exact same words. Eventually, I got up and tried to leave, and she followed me, so I locked myself inside my walk-in wardrobe, where I remained until almost 5 a.m., being shouted at through the door, about the same thing, using the same words, like a broken record player, without any apparent reduction in volume or enthusiasm. She's now my ex-girlfriend, unsurprisingly, that relationship didn't last. The Explanation The truth is, in every interpersonal conflict in your life, business, romantic or platonic, communication is both the problem and the solution. You can predict the long-term health of any relationship by whether each conflict makes the relationship stronger or weaker. Healthy conflict strengthens relationships because those involved are working against a problem, unhealthy conflict weakens a relationship because those involved are working against each other. I sat down with Taylai Shero, professor of cognitive neuroscience at University College London and MIT, to understand what the science of the brain can teach us about the laws of effective communication, and what she shared with me changed my personal life, romantic relationships, and business negotiations forever. Shero and her team's study, published in Nature Neuroscience, recorded the brain activity of volunteers during disagreements to find out what was happening inside their minds. The experiment was based on asking 42 people, grouped into pairs, to make a financial evaluation. Each pair lay, separated by a glass wall, in a brain imaging scanner. Their reactions to the experiment were recorded. They were shown pictures of real estate and asked, individually within their pairs, to guess its value and to place a bet on the accuracy of their valuation. Each volunteer was able to see the valuation of their partner on a screen. When the couple agreed on a valuation, they each placed higher bets on its accuracy and the researchers monitoring their brain activity saw their brains light up, indicating that they were more cognitively receptive and open. However, if they disagreed about a valuation, their brains seemed to freeze and shut down, causing them to turn off to the other's opinion and value that opinion less. Charo's findings shed light on some recent trends around contentious areas of political discourse. An example being climate change, despite scientists presenting more and more irrefutable evidence over the last 10 years showing that climate change is man-made, a survey conducted by the Pew Research Center indicates that the number of U.S. Republicans who believe the scientific evidence has decreased in the same 10-year period. Furious arguing, regardless of evidence, is clearly not working. So. Here's what needs to be done if we want to increase our chances of being heard by someone on an opposing side. According to Shero, if you want to keep someone's brain lit up and receptive to your point of view, you must not start your response with a statement of disagreement. When you find yourself disagreeing with someone, avoid the emotional temptation, at all costs, to start your response with, I disagree, or you're wrong, and instead introduce your rebuttal with what you have in common, what you agree on and the parts of their argument that you can understand. 
The strength of any carefully reasoned, logical argument isn't likely to be recognized when you open with disagreement, regardless of how much evidence you have or how objectively correct you are. Instead, if we start from a place of agreement, of common ground, we increase the chance that the strength of our arguments, the accuracy of our logic and the weight of the evidence will be received at all. This third law, to never disagree, is the critical skill that will allow you to become an effective negotiator, speaker, salesperson, business leader, writer, and partner. When I interviewed Julian Treasure, the speaking and communication coach whose TED Talk has been viewed 100 million times, and Paul Brunson, the matchmaking and relationship expert known as the Love Doctor, they both explained that the art of becoming a great communicator, conversationalist, or partner is first listening so that the other person feels heard, and then making sure you reply in a way that makes them feel understood. Taylor Sharos' studies in neuroscience now provide clear scientific evidence that shows why this approach of making someone feel heard and understood is so crucial in changing someone's mind. It's no surprise that the people who are most likely to change our minds are the ones we agree with on 98% of topics, we feel that they fundamentally understand us, so we're more open to listening to them. The law, you must never disagree. In the midst of a negotiation, debate, or heated argument, try and remember that the key to changing someone's mind is finding a shared belief or motive that will keep their brain open to your point of view. Our words should be bridges to comprehension, not barriers to connection. Disagree less, understand more. Law 4. You do not get to choose what you believe. This law will teach you how to change any belief that you have, whether that's your self-belief, beliefs about others or beliefs about the world, while also showing you how to change the stubborn beliefs of others. Think of someone that you absolutely love, your mother, your father, your partner, your dog, the most important person, or animal, in your life. Now visualize them tied to a chair, being held at gunpoint by an aggressive terrorist. Now imagine that the terrorist says to you, if you don't believe that I'm Jesus Christ right now, I will pull the trigger and kill them. What do you do? The truth is, the most you could do is lie, the most you could do is tell them that you believe they're Jesus Christ, in the hope that your loved one would be spared. But you couldn't, genuinely, make yourself believe it. This thought experiment illuminates a profound and controversial point about the true nature of our beliefs. In my hypothetical scenario, when everything was on the line, you still couldn't choose to believe something that you don't. So, what makes you think you can choose any of your beliefs? To investigate this concept further, I surveyed 1000 people and asked them all the following question, do you think you choose your beliefs? Incredibly, 857, 85.7% of them said that they did. On the next page of the survey, when I asked people if they could genuinely believe a terrorist holding their loved one at gunpoint was Jesus Christ if it meant it would save their loved one's life, 98% of people admitted that they couldn't choose that belief, the most they could do was lie. The fundamental beliefs you hold about yourself, the fundamental beliefs you hold about others, the fundamental beliefs you hold about the world, you've chosen none of them. When people hear this, they tend to have a visceral negative reaction, because it sounds disempowering and attacks our sense of free will, control, and independence. If I can't choose a belief, how can I ever change a belief? Does that condemn me to the current beliefs I have about the world, others, and myself? Thankfully, it doesn't. Your life is a testament to the fact that your beliefs do continually change and evolve, I'm assuming you don't still believe in Santa Claus. Society too, continues to change its beliefs at an increasing speed, in the 1700s, people thought tobacco was healthy and doctors would blow tobacco smoke up the arse of a drowned person in an attempt to revive them, in the 1800s we believed clit oral orgasms were a sign of insanity and doctors would medically treat people who had them, as recently as the 1970s, people believed space aliens were sending us coded messages by flattening our crops on farms in middle America, and medieval doctors pulled their cures out of their arses, literally, poop was believed to be a cure for everything from headaches to epilepsy. Thankfully, beliefs change. Our brains consume a huge amount of energy and have therefore evolved strategies to preserve energy in order to survive. Because one of the brain's main purposes is to predict by spotting patterns and making assumptions based on those patterns, it must do so as efficiently and in as little time as possible. 
Beliefs allow the brain to make such forecasts quickly. Having stubborn beliefs is a useful survival tool for humans because beliefs drive behavior. Your ancestors, who stubbornly held the belief that lions are dangerous, fire is hot and deep water is to be avoided, survived long enough because of these beliefs to have babies who possessed the same stubbornness. Going back to the example of the terrorist holding your loved one hostage under threat of execution, now imagine the terrorist grabbed a glass of water and turned it into wine, an act Jesus is known for. Would this change your beliefs about the terrorist? Would you now believe that the terrorist is in fact Jesus Christ? In my survey, 77 percenter said that this would be enough to convince them that the terrorist was in fact Jesus Christ, and in total 82 percenter said their beliefs about the terrorist would change. The act of witnessing someone turn water into wine was strong enough evidence to cause them to change their belief. This thought experiment and the corresponding survey reveal a fundamental truth about the nature of all of our beliefs, the things you believe are fundamentally based on some form of primary evidence. However, scientific studies have repeatedly proved that whether that evidence is objectively true or false doesn't actually matter, we subjectively accept evidence to be true based on our experiences and biases. There are still 300,000 Americans who believe the Earth is flat, in a recent Ipsos survey. 21 percenter of adult Americans said they believed Santa Claus is real, a disturbing number of people believe King Charles is a vampire, one in three Americans believe Bigfoot exists, and one in four Scottish people believe there is a giant monster living in a lake near Inverness. To change their beliefs, simply telling them they're wrong, as we've seen in Law 3, won't work. Showing a flat Earth or a legitimate picture of a round planet Earth also doesn't work, and Despite what motivational coaches might say, telling someone who had their confidence destroyed at seven years old by vicious playground bullies, very strong evidence, to simply believe in themselves or to repeat affirmations in a mirror, won't do anything to change their underlying beliefs about themselves either. Seeing is believing. Just showing a flat earth or a picture of the spherical earth taken from space by NASA doesn't work because in order to believe what they're seeing, they have to trust not only the picture, but the credibility of the source from which the picture came, NASA. Flat Earthers trust neither, they believe NASA is fraudulent, astronauts are actors and the scientific community is in on it. In Dr. Robert Cialdini's renowned book Influence, he explains that if we trust someone's authority on a matter, if Lionel Messi tells us that Adidas football boots are better than Nike, if a personal trainer tells us we're lifting a weight incorrectly or if a doctor tells us we need to take a pill, we're very likely to defer to their authority, adopt their belief and do what they say. For some of our most important beliefs we have no evidence at all, except that people we love and trust hold these beliefs. Considering how little we know, the confidence we have in our beliefs is preposterous, and it is also essential. 2002 Nobel Prize Laureate Daniel Kahneman Authority figures are powerful forces for belief change, but the most powerful force of all is first-party evidence from our own five physical senses. As the phrase goes, seeing is believing. Because the flat earth community is so distrustful of science, astronomy, and really anyone qualified, the only conceivable way that you could upend their stubborn beliefs is to send them to space to have a look for themselves. This need to see evidence with our own eyes explains why so many crazy conspiracy theories withstand the test of time, why people dismiss climate change, believe the earth is flat and question the efficacy of vaccines, these things are impossible for most of us to see for ourselves. Likewise, someone lacking confidence in their speaking abilities is unlikely to become confident just because their mum tells them they're a good speaker, they will need to acquire first-party evidence themselves, by speaking on stage and getting positive feedback from bias-free sources they trust. We believe ourselves in our own eyes to be trusted sources, making it important for scientists to involve our five senses to make their insights accessible to us. With this principle in mind, climate change educators are now trying to translate scientific insights about the occurrence and speed of climate change into local lessons, for example showing the impact of climate change on things in our local area so that we can go and see it for ourselves. Confidence in existing beliefs I asked Taylor Chereau, who we met in the previous law, how do we change our or someone else's belief? She has spent years researching and conducting multiple studies on why beliefs exist why they're hard to change and how to change them. She told me that the brain considers any new evidence alongside the current evidence it has stored. So, if I told you I had seen a pink elephant flying in the sky, 
your brain will compare this new evidence to your existing evidence that elephants aren't pink and they can't fly, and likely reject it. However, if I told a three-year-old that I had seen a pink elephant flying in the sky, they would likely believe me because they have yet to form strong opposing beliefs about elephants, aviation, and the laws of physics. Charo asserts that there are four factors that determine whether a new piece of evidence will change an existing belief. A person's current evidence. Their confidence in their current evidence. The new evidence. Their confidence in that new evidence. And as we learn from the widely discussed phenomenon called confirmation bias, whereby humans tend to search for, favor and recall information in a way that confirms or supports their existing beliefs or values, the further the new evidence is from their current beliefs, the less likely it is to change their thinking. We change our minds if it sounds like good news. All of this means that strongly held false beliefs are very hard to change, but there is one important exception, when the counter evidence is exactly what you want to hear, you are more likely to change your mind. For example, in a 2011 study in which people were told that others see them as much more attractive than they see themselves, they were happy to change their self-perception. And in a 2016 study in which people learned that their genes suggested that they were much more resistant to disease than they thought, the participants were again quick to change their beliefs. What about politics? Back in August 2016, 900 American citizens were asked to predict the results of the presidential election by putting a little arrow on a scale that went from Clinton to Trump. So, if you thought Clinton was highly likely to win, you put the arrow right next to Clinton. If you thought the odds were 50 50ths, you put the arrow in the middle, and so on. They were first asked, who do you want to win, to which 50 percenter said they wanted Clinton to win and 50 percenter said they wanted Trump to win. When they were asked who they thought was going to win, both groups of supporters put the arrow closest to Clinton, indicating that they believed she would win. Then a new poll was introduced, predicting a Trump victory. And everyone was asked again who they thought was going to win. Did the new poll change their predictions? Indeed, it did. But it predominantly changed the predictions of the Trump supporters, because it was exactly what they wanted to hear. They were elated that the new poll was suggesting a Trump victory, and were quick to change their predictions. The Clinton supporters didn't change their predictions much, and many of them ignored the new poll altogether. Don't attack beliefs, inspire new ones. Taylor Shero concluded that in order to change beliefs, the secret is to go along with how our brain works, not to fight against it, which is what most people try and fail to do. Don't try and break or argue with someone's existing evidence, instead focus on implanting completely new evidence, and make sure you've highlighted the incredibly positive impact this new evidence will have on them. One example of this is of parents' reaction to the false link drawn up between the mumps, measles, and rubella, MMR, vaccine and autism, in a now debunked journal article that was published in 1998. As news of the article's theory spread, Many parents refused to vaccinate their children, and held on to their beliefs stubbornly. Eventually, a group of researchers changed their minds, not by trying to break their existing beliefs, they didn't focus on their existing beliefs at all, but by offering the parents new information about the very positive benefits of the vaccine, true information about how it prevents kids from encountering deadly disease. And it worked, parents agreed to have their children vaccinated. Detailed self-review can reduce any belief. Interestingly, people won't lower the conviction of their beliefs when you attack them or try to convince them with data, but they will lose conviction when asked to explain or analyze the details of their beliefs. This is a technique cognitive behavioral therapists know well. The New Yorker's Elizabeth Colbert described a study conducted at Yale where graduate students were asked to rate their understanding of their own toilet at home. They were then asked to write detailed, step-by-step -step explanations of how the device works. Once they'd attempted to explain the inner workings of a toilet, they were asked to rate their understanding again. Their belief in their understanding of toilets dropped significantly. In a similar study conducted in 2012, people were asked about their stance on political proposals relating to health care. As Colbert describes, participants were asked to rate their positions depending on how strongly they agreed or disagreed. Next, they were instructed to explain, in as much detail as they could, the impacts of implementing each proposal. Most people at this point ran into trouble. Asked once again to rate their views, 
the conviction of their beliefs decreased and they either agreed or disagreed less vehemently. Asking someone to explain the detail and logic underpinning their strongly held beliefs is a profoundly powerful way to reduce their conviction. This works for limiting beliefs too. If someone is struggling with their self-belief and believes they're worthless, having them explain in as much detail as they can, why they feel that way, and questioning their responses, is an effective way to get them to relinquish that belief. The growth zone is where new evidence exists. As you learned in Law 2, when I was younger, I struggled with awful stage fright, which itself is underpinned by a set of limiting beliefs. Telling me it was, all going to be okay, was not enough to change my preconceptions about speaking on stage, how I would perform and what the reaction would be, my beliefs were too stubborn. The reason my stage fright eventually vanished, to the point that now I feel 99.9% .9 less nervous when speaking in a packed arena or live on TV, is simply because I carried on speaking on stage. And doing so gradually gave me new, positive, first-party evidence that replaced the existing evidence I had about my onstage abilities, the more I spoke on stage, the stronger my confidence in this new evidence became, and with it, the belief in my inability and the fear it created diminished. Do the thing you fear, and keep on doing it. That is the quickest and surest way ever yet discovered to conquer fear. Dale Carnegie This, for me, is maybe the most important fundamental truth about belief change and how to increase a person's self-belief, even. Our own, beliefs change when a person gets new counteracting evidence that they have a high degree of subjective confidence in. If a friend of yours has a limiting belief about themselves, or you have a limiting belief about yourself, the best chance you have of changing that belief isn't by reading self-help books, inspirational quotes or watching motivational videos, it's by stepping out of your comfort zone and into a situation where that limiting belief will be confronted head-on with new first-party evidence. This is how you change even the most stubborn beliefs. This is how I went from being deeply religious to agnostic in the space of 12 months, from low confidence to self-believing in my transition from childhood to adulthood, and from being a terrified public speaker to having unshakable confidence on any stage. The law, you do not get to choose what you believe. Beliefs are stubborn, but they are malleable. To change a belief, a person must find a way to attain convincing new evidence that they can trust. They're more likely to believe the validity of this new evidence if its source agrees with their other existing beliefs. Evidence that offers positive outcomes is the easiest evidence for someone to believe. If you interrogate the validity and detail of one of your own limiting beliefs, your conviction in it will weaken. If you want to change someone's belief, don't attack it, make them a direct witness to positive new evidence that will both inspire them. And counteract the negative effects of their old beliefs. Unchallenged limiting beliefs are the greatest barrier between who we are and who we could be. Stop telling yourself you are not qualified, good enough or worthy. Growth happens when you start doing the things you are not qualified to do. Law 5. You must lean into bizarre behavior. This law is responsible for every successful company I've ever built, it teaches you how to stay at the forefront of the rapidly changing world we live in, how to capitalize on change and how to avoid ever being left behind by any of the incoming technological revolutions. The story. People love music, that's why we'll always be in business. These were the fateful words uttered by the former CEO of one of the world's largest music stores as he peered over the second floor balcony out onto his bustling shop floor. Years later, his global music store was out of business. He was right, people do love music. But they don't love traveling for an hour, in the rain, wrestling through a busy shop floor to get a plastic disc and then queuing to pay for it. He misjudged what his customers wanted, they wanted music, they didn't want CDs iTunes, the digital music platform built by Apple, had emerged in the spring of 2003, allowing his disc-buying customers to get what they wanted, music, without all the inconvenience. I'm told on good authority that this particular CEO was so cynical about digital music that he wouldn't even entertain conversations with his senior leadership team about its introduction or the threat it posed. One of his professional associates told me that he had leaned out, because he didn't understand it, he thought the space was rife with piracy and that it wouldn't directly impact people's love of CDs. I believe writer Clifford Stahl had also leaned out when he made the following scornful prediction about the future of the Internet, which was published in Newsweek in February 1995. 
I'm uneasy about this most trendy and oversold community. Visionaries see a future of telecommuting workers, interactive libraries, and multimedia classrooms. They speak of electronic town meetings and virtual communities. Commerce and business will shift from offices and malls to networks and modems. Baloney. The truth is no online database will replace your daily newspaper. Newsweek would end up discontinuing their print magazine and moving their entire business onto the internet. In 1903, the president of a leading bank had certainly leaned out when he told Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Company, the horse is here to stay but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. In 1992, Andy Grove, the CEO of Intel, had clearly leaned out when he said, the idea of a personal communicator in every pocket is a pipe dream driven by greed. And the former CEO of Microsoft Steve Ballmer had certainly leaned out when he laughed at Apple and said, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. At 19 years old I had a meeting at the beautiful London offices of one of the world's leading fashion brands. It was 2012 and social media had caught on among consumers, but brands were lagging behind, as they always seem to do with new technology. My mission that day was to persuade the brand's marketing department, namely their marketing director, to take social media more seriously, to lean in, and more specifically to launch their own social media pages. I failed. I was berated, mocked, and dismissed. The marketing director I was pitching to was visibly terrified, so people will be able to comment on our posts and criticize us, he questioned. I don't want our brand to go viral, how would we control that, he continued. Magazine advertising is doing well for us and social media is just too dangerous. He ended the meeting midway through my presentation and needless to say, he never called me back. My company would go from strength to strength, arguably becoming the most influential marketing company in its market. The brand I met that day filed for bankruptcy in 2019. The Explanation Leaning out, as I define it, isn't about being wrong. It's about being so arrogantly sure that you're right that you refuse to listen, learn, and pay attention to new information. This isn't just a symptom of arrogance, unfortunately, it's often a symptom of being human, the psychological reason why people lean out of important, potentially vital information is because of the incredibly well-studied psychological phenomenon known as cognitive dissonance. Coined by the American psychologist Leon Festinger in the 1950s, Cognitive dissonance describes the tension you experience when your thoughts conflict with your behavior. Being a smoker, for example, is dissonant, it conflicts with the evidence that smoking is incredibly harmful. To resolve this tension, the smoker must either give up or find a way to justify their behavior. We can all think of the excuses smokers use, from, I only smoke on occasion, to, there are far worse things you can do to your body, to, why shouldn't I be free to behave as I choose? For Festinger, cognitive dissonance helped explain why so many of us live with contradictory ideas or values. But it can also stop us from changing our minds when we should, even when it could save careers, jobs, businesses, or lives. Research has shown that cognitive dissonance is most painful for us when we encounter facts or evidence that destabilize or conflict with how we see ourselves, that undermine our identity and confidence in ourselves, or that make us feel in some way threatened. In business, anyone who is too rigidly fixed to an ideology probably won't provide the solution, because resolving a problem often requires enough humility to disregard your initial hypothesis and listen to what the market is telling you. We would rather be dead than wrong. Making a public statement about your views on something, as the CEO of Intel did about mobile phones, or the CEO of Microsoft did about the iPhone, risks putting an additional nail in your coffin, because once we've made a commitment to a belief, our brains will fight tirelessly to prove that we were right, even when we're clearly wrong. Time and time again, research shows that as soon as we make any decision, I will vote for this party, I'm going to buy a house in this area, I think COVID-19 is serious, no, I'm sure the risks are being exaggerated, we automatically begin justifying and rationalizing it. Quite quickly any doubts we initially had will disappear. The American psychologist Elliot Aronson, who studied this phenomenon, famously assembled a discussion group of pompous, dull people. Some of the participants were made to endure an arduous selection process, others were allowed to join immediately, without expending any effort. 
Those who were given the runaround reported enjoying the group far more than the ones who were simply let in. Aronson explained what was happening here, whenever we've invested time, money, or energy into something and it ends up being a complete waste of time, this creates dissonance, which we try to reduce by finding ways of justifying our bad decision. Aronson's participants focused unconsciously on what might be interesting, or at least bearable, about being part of a deliberately boring group. The people who had invested very little effort in joining therefore had less dissonance to reduce, and more readily admitted what a waste of time it had been. We won't listen to the other side. It wasn't just that fashion brand's marketing director that dismissed me. For the first three years of my social media marketing company's existence, we were attacked, berated, and criticized daily. Commentators called us parasites, said our business was a fad and predicted we'd be bankrupt in a few months. I remember consoling my tearful co-founder, Hannah Anderson, in 2015, when BuzzFeed News wrote a critical article challenging our character, practices, and credibility. Unsurprisingly, the attacks always came from people from the traditional media and marketing world, TV, print, and radio. They viewed us as the annoying, new kids on the marketing block. One commentator said we were, mysterious social media hackers and another journalist wrote that we were making millions from our, less than savory advertising practices. The truth is, we weren't doing anything that revolutionary, they just didn't understand it, and on some level it threatened their sense of identity that a, group of 20-somethings in Manchester, was taking over marketing, as one journalist described it. When we don't understand something, someone, a new idea or technology, and when that new thing challenges our identity, intelligence, or livelihood, instead of listening and leaning in, in an attempt to ease our cognitive dissonance, we too often lean out and attack them. This might make us feel good, but an ostrich with its head in the sand is at great risk of being eaten. This explains why the most important innovations in our lives received the most criticism when they were first introduced, they threatened to disrupt people's sense of identity, intelligence, and understanding. For this very reason I've long held the belief that passionate criticism of a technology is usually a positive indicator of its potential, it's a sign that there's something worth leaning into, someone is threatened and innovation is coming. This is why I leaned into what is known as, Web 3.0, blockchain technology, or crypto, and founded a software company in this space called Third Web, because all the right people were dismissing, attacking, and angry about it. This wave of pessimism gave me flashbacks to 2012 when I first launched a Web 2.0, social media, company, and so I reserved judgment and did my own research. Beneath all the nefarious money-grabbing and short-sighted behavior, which is common when a new technology emerges, I found an underlying technological revolution in blockchain that I believe will make many functions of our lives easier, better, faster and cheaper. ThirdWeb was recently valued at $160 million in our latest investment round and we now have hundreds of thousands of clients using our tools. Even if a new innovation doesn't beget a wave of critics, it's important to remember that innovation disrupts because it's different. By definition, it should look weird, it should feel unconventional, it should be misunderstood, and it should sound wrong, stupid, dumb, or even illegal. I interviewed advertising legend Rory Sutherland, vice chairman of the Ogilvy Advertising Group, on this very topic, and he told me, all too often, what matters to people is not whether an idea is true or effective, but whether it fits with the preconceptions of a dominant convention or incumbent. New things put ego, status, jobs, and identities at stake. You see this cognitive dissonance and avoidance everywhere you look. Whenever we feel an affinity with an ideology, politician, newspaper, brand, or technology, that very allegiance distorts evidence that conflicts with those loyalties. If we believe someone is, on the other side, there is dissonance before they've said a word. How to become a, lean-in person. To quote the education entrepreneur Michael Simmons, if someone is 40 years old today, the rate of change they experience in 2040, when they're 60, will be four times what it is now. What feels like a year's worth of change by today's standards will occur in three months. When someone who is 10 today is 60, they'll experience a year of today's rate of change in just 11 days. To summarize the profundity of this extreme acceleration of change, Ray Kurzweil, arguably the world's preeminent futurist, says, we won't experience 100 years of technological advance in the 21st century, we will witness in the order of 20,000 years of progress, 
when measured by today's rate of progress, or about 1,000 times greater rate of change than what was achieved in the 20th century. Change is only going to get faster, so expect your feelings of cognitive dissonance, the feeling that something doesn't make sense and conflicts with what you already know, to increase. As discussed in Laws 3 and 4, admitting we're wrong, rather than reflexively jumping to self-justification or dismissal, requires self-reflection and, at least temporarily, dissonance. You don't want to be the entrepreneur that misses the next technological revolution, you don't want to be the CMO that dismisses the next big marketing opportunity, you don't want to be the journalist that dismisses the next frontier of media. You don't want to be a lean-out person. With the aforementioned rate of change in mind, there's going to be a lot more things that tempt you to lean out. Thankfully, there are a few practical and mental techniques we can adopt to reduce this dissonance and the lean-out behavior it creates. One technique is to default to believing that two seemingly conflicting ideas can be true at the same time and having a bias to keep them separate, a technique Elliot Aronson and his fellow social psychologist Carol Tavris refer to as the Shimon Peres solution. Former Prime Minister of Israel Shimon Peres was angry when his friend Ronald Reagan, the American president, made an official visit to a cemetery in Germany where former Nazis were buried. Paris was asked how he felt about Reagan's decision to visit the cemetery. He could have chosen one of two ways to reduce dissonance. Renounced the friendship. Dismissed Reagan's visit as trivial and not worth worrying about. Yet Paris resorted to neither of these responses, instead simply saying, when a friend makes a mistake, the friend remains a friend and the mistake remains a mistake. Paris managed to hold the dissonance, and resisted the urge to force two things to make perfect sense. It's a lesson in avoiding easy, knee-jerk responses or being pressured into a binary choice, and instead accepting nuance and recognizing that two apparently conflicting things can be true at the same time. Despite what passionate online tribalism might tempt you to believe, your most important beliefs should not be binary, lean and people can see the merit of the old way and the new way at the same time without the compulsion to reject or condemn either. In moments of dissonance, when we're faced with ideas, innovations, and information that we don't understand, which challenge our conventions or threaten our identity, Web 3.0, AI, virtual reality, social media, opposing political ideologies and social movements, the key is to reserve the temptation of judgment, which is often just an attempt to ease our cognitive dissonance, to lean in, to study and to ask honest questions, why am I believing what I believe? Is it possible that I'm wrong? Do I know what I'm talking about? Am I leaning out because I don't understand? Am I following the party line? Are these my own beliefs or the beliefs of the people like me? Those that have the patience and conviction to do this will undoubtedly own the future. Those that don't will continue to be left behind. The law, you must lean into bizarre behavior. When you don't understand, lean in more. When it challenges your intelligence, lean in more. When it makes you feel stupid, lean in more. Leaning out will leave you behind. Don't block people that you don't agree with, follow more of them. Don't run from ideas that make you uncomfortable, run towards them. Taking no risks will be your biggest risk. You have to risk failure to succeed. You have to risk heartbreak to love. You have to risk criticism for the applause. You have to risk the ordinary to achieve the extraordinary. If you live avoiding risk, you're risking missing out on life. Law 6. Ask, don't tell, the question slash behavior effect. This law reveals one of the most simple and effective psychological tricks that you can use to motivate someone to do something, form a habit or perform a desired behavior. You can use it on yourself or someone else. It's 1980 in America. Ronald Reagan is running for president against Jimmy Carter, who'd been elected in 1976. The economy is in a horrific state, and Reagan must convince voters that it's time to kick Carter out of the White House. In the last week of the 1980 presidential campaign, on October 28, the two candidates held their one and only presidential debate and 80.6 million viewers tuned in to watch, making it the most watched debate in American history at the time. Going into the debate, Incumbent President Carter had an eight-point lead according to polls. Reagan knew he needed to use Carter's abysmal economic performance against him but, instead of doing what every presidential candidate before him had done and stating the economic facts, he did something that no one had ever done, 
but every presidential candidate seems to have done since, he asked a simple but now legendary question, are you better off now than you were four years ago? He said. Next Tuesday, all of you will go to the polls, you'll stand there in the polling place and make a decision. I think when you make that decision, it might be well if you would ask yourself, are you better off than you were four years ago? Is it easier for you to go and buy things in the stores than it was four years ago? Is there more or less unemployment in the country than there was four years ago? Is America as respected throughout the world as it was? And if you answer all of those questions yes, why then I think your choice is very obvious as to who you will vote for. A televote poll carried out by ABC News immediately after the debate received about 650,000 responses, and almost 70 percent of respondents said Reagan had won the debate. Seven days later, on November 4, Reagan defeated Carter by 10 points, in a historic landslide victory, to become the 40th president of the United States. Just a question? No, political magic backed by science. Why? Questions, unlike statements, elicit an active response, they make people think. That's why researchers at Ohio State University have found that when the facts are clearly on your side, questions become extremely more effective than simply making a statement. The power of the question slash behavior effect. We all make commitments we fail to honor. How many times have you said, I'll eat better this year, or I'll exercise every morning this week, only to fall short of your plan? Of course we intend to follow through, but good intentions aren't enough to create meaningful change. A well-designed question, however, might be. After combing through more than 100 studies spanning 40 years of research, a team of scientists from four U.S. universities discovered that asking is better than telling when it comes to influencing your own or another's behavior. David Sprott, a co-author of the research from Washington State University said, if you question a person about performing a future behavior, the likelihood of that behavior happening will change. Questions prompt a psychological reaction that is different from the reaction to statements. This means, for instance, that a sign that says, please recycle is much less likely to increase its viewer's chance of recycling than a sign that says, will you recycle? Telling yourself, I will eat vegetables today, is less likely to increase your chances of eating vegetables than asking yourself the question, will I eat vegetables today? Astonishingly, researchers found that turning a statement into a question could influence a person's behavior for up to six months. The question slash behavior effect is even more powerful with questions that can only be answered with either yes or no. The question slash behavior effect is at its strongest when questions are used to encourage behavior that fits the receiver's personal and social ambitions, when answering yes to the question would bring them closer to who they want to be. Starting the question with will implies ownership in action, and causes the question slash behavior effect to be even stronger than starting your question with a word like can or could, which imply the question is about ability rather than action. It's also stronger than starting your question with would, which is conditional and implies possibility more than probability. Using cognitive dissonance in your favor. In Law 5 I explained how harmful the phenomenon of cognitive dissonance can be, I'm now going to tell you how helpful it can be. Cognitive dissonance describes the mental discomfort you experience when the best you, the person you really want to be, doesn't match up with the person you currently are. Let's say you aspire to be an expert in Tai Chi and a friend asks whether you practice Tai Chi daily. Answering no would create cognitive dissonance because it would highlight a disconcerting mismatch between who you want to be and who you actually are. To remove that mismatch you are likely to answer yes. And, once you've done that, your aspiration is more likely to become a reality because the question has reminded you of not only who you want to be but the path to becoming that person, and you've set an intention to walk. That path, all in the form of one small but powerful question. The reason this works even more effectively when answering a yes or no question is because these binary choices don't allow for justification and excuses, both of which allow us to wriggle away from confronting the reality of who we want to be and what we need to do to get there. If you've read my first book, you'll know that my wonderful PA, Sophie, likes to announce every week that she's going to the gym on Monday. On occasion, when I've been naive and gullible enough to ask her if she went to the gym on the aforesaid Monday, she'll respond with a long, elaborate reason why it wasn't possible and follow that with a new announcement that she's going to go next Monday instead. She's continued this routine every week for eight years now. 
The great thing about a yes or no question is it doesn't give you any wiggle room to deceive yourself. It forces you to commit one way or the other. So, if you start making excuses for your behavior or want to lecture someone about what they should do differently, try this instead, ask yourself or them a simple question to which the answer can only be yes or no. It works really well when focusing on an area that could benefit from some additional motivation. Will I go to the gym today? Will I order healthy food for lunch? Allow no explanation. Just yes or no. Recently, I went for a run near my girlfriend's house in Porto, Portugal. The area is known for its steep hills, but as I approached one particularly terrifying hill that was so steep it appeared almost vertical, the question slash behavior effect came to my rescue. I asked myself, will you keep running, without stopping, until you've reached the top? I told myself yes. I can't really explain it, but for some reason it really helped, I made it to the top without stopping, it killed any possible excuses I might have used to stop and it created a promise to myself that I didn't want to break. Use the question slash behavior effect to help others, ask a friend or loved one, will you eat more healthily, or will you go for that promotion? This gentle confrontation has been repeatedly proven to lead to reliable, meaningful change and encourages people to be their best selves. Use it in your job. If you're a waiter in a restaurant serving a table of happy customers, instead of telling them, I hope you enjoyed your food, when you're collecting their plates, instead ask, how was the food, just as you're handing over the bill, right before it's time for them to decide on the tip. As President Reagan taught us, when the facts are clearly on your side, questions become extremely powerful tools for encouraging the behavior you want. The law, ask, don't tell, the question slash behavior effect. If you want to create positive behavior, don't make statements, ask binary yes or no questions. People are more likely to answer yes if it will bring them closer to who they want to be, and once they answer yes, that yes is more likely to come true. Ask questions of your actions, and your actions will answer. Law 7. Never compromise your self-story. This law introduces a concept you've probably never heard before called your self-story, it shows you how your self-story determines your success in life, and gives you the secret strategy for writing a better self-story about yourself, so you can achieve big ambitions. A lot of people don't know this. Chris Eubank Jr. said, as he leaned forward ominously in his chair. Chris Eubank Jr., championship boxer and son of the International Boxing Hall of Fame legend Chris Eubank, had stopped by my house to be interviewed by me in preparation for this book. He continued. But 80 percenter of being a fighter is mental. The balls, the guts, and the grit that you have to have, to walk through crowds of thousands of people. And while you are walking, knowing that once you get to that ring and walk up those stairs, you are going to have to take off your jacket. The bell's going to ring and you're going to have to fight somebody. You're going to have to get hurt and you're going to have to hurt somebody, in front of millions of people watching around the world. That in itself, that walk, most people on the planet cannot do that. Just the walk, let alone the fight part, it takes huge mental strength. Me, do you think you can train someone to have that mental strength? You bank JR, I think you can, I've seen fighters develop it, and you need it. At the end of the day, there are going to be times in training, in sparring and definitely in fighting where you're going to get really hurt. You're going to be in a position where you're questioning yourself. What am I doing here? Am I going to be okay? Can I beat this guy? Should I give up? Should I find a way out? This is too much. Every fighter experiences that moment, you know. Me, have you ever seriously considered quitting in a fight? Long pause. You bank JR, there was this one time where I was close to giving. Up. I went to Cuba before I turned pro. Out there, the guys are animals. They're monsters. I get in the ring to do a casual sparring session and then the Cuban Olympic heavyweight representative walks up the stairs and gets into the ring. I thought he was coming into the ring to shadow box and warm up for his sparring session with somebody else. And they said, no, 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 no you guys are going to spar. I was like, uh, he's about three times the size of me. What do you mean? And they said, no, no, he'll work with you, just a casual spar. So I thought, sure. That's fine. Let's go. 
The bell goes for the first round and this guy sprints over to me and just starts laying into me. The biggest shots I've ever taken. Bang, bang, bang. I'm dodging, moving out the way, running around the ring. And he's just coming at me and I can't get this guy off me. Bang, bang, bang. He knocks me out of the ring. It's a four foot drop out of the ring onto solid concrete. My knee hits the concrete and my leg goes completely dead. I tried getting up and my leg is completely gone. I'm looking up and this Cuban heavyweight is leaning over the ropes, looking down at me. I'm at a mental crossroads and I have a decision to make. Do I say, listen, my knee's bad. You're too big. Or do I get back in? I'm sat there on the concrete, looking around. Everyone's looking at me, my dad is there. I made a decision. I was like, you know what, let's fucking go. I got back in, and the Cuban just started laying into me again for another two painful rounds. But the only thing I could think was, I have to finish the three rounds, because I said I was going to do the three rounds. I'm not leaving this gym with everybody knowing that I quit. Because I couldn't live with myself. I've got to go home and go to sleep. I can't go to sleep knowing that another man made me quit. So I got back into that ring and I took my beating like a man. And from that day on, I was never scared again. It was the worst experience of my life, but it was also the best experience of my life because I now knew what I was capable of. I knew I had it inside me to not give up. If he can't make me quit, who's going to make me quit? Nobody. And that belief stayed with me for the rest of my career. Me, that's incredible. You're talking about a story you're writing. About yourself, for yourself, and how important that story is in determining how you behave in the future. You bank JR, exactly. In training it happens the most, there are. Times I'll be on the treadmill, where I'll be running, and I'll get cramp in my calf and I've still got 8 minutes to go, because I've set the timer for 40 minutes and I'm on 32 minutes. The cramp starts and I will run with one leg, literally limping, because if the treadmill can make me quit, what happens when I get into the ring with a guy who's hit me, and I'm hurt? He's going to make me quit too. It's hugely important because it teaches you to believe that no matter how hard things get, you are the type of person that will find a way. It doesn't matter if people are watching, or if nobody would know I quit. You can't quit when no one is watching, you don't ever want to put that, that spirit inside yourself, you've got to keep those demons out. They are demons and if you let them in often enough, they will take over. I hated every minute of training, but I said, don't quit. Sewer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. Muhammad Ali Your self-story creates mental toughness. The US military is the most powerful on earth. Each year, roughly 1,300 cadets join its famously demanding military academy at West Point. Part of their initiation involves a series of extremely difficult challenges called beast barracks. These, according to researchers who studied West Point cadets, are deliberately engineered to test the very limits of cadets' mental capacities. When I read about this study, I, like most people, assumed that the cadets with the most stamina, intelligence, physical strength, and athleticism would be the most successful. But when Angela Duckworth, a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, studied their achievements, and more specifically, how mental toughness, perseverance, and passion impact ability to achieve goals, she found something very surprising. Duckworth tracked almost 2,500 cadets spread across two initiation classes. She compared several metrics including their high school rank, SAT scores, physical aptitude test results and grit scale, which measures perseverance and passion for long-term goals with a grade from 1 to 5. It turned out that it wasn't physical strength, intelligence, or leadership potential that gave the most accurate indication of whether a cadet would make it through beast barracks, it came down to mental toughness, matched with determination to reach a long-term goal. Perseverance was the most important thing. Believe it or not, cadets who were just one standard deviation point higher on the grit scale were 60% or more likely to make it through beast barracks. Research continues to reveal that your self-story and the mental toughness, grit, or resilience that you have is more important than anything else for achieving your goals in business and in life. That's very good to know because while you can't do much about your physicality or the innate abilities you are born with, you can do a lot to develop your self-story. Unfortunately, 
Our self-story isn't just influenced by the first-party evidence we've collected about ourselves, it's also influenced profoundly by the stereotypes around us. For instance, if the society you live in holds the stereotype that black people are less capable than white people, and you're a black person, you will likely internalize that belief and it will become part of your self-story, the science shows how this stereotype alone can significantly impact your self-story, your performance and ultimately your results. At 8 years old, I was eagerly putting on my swimming shorts in the school changing room ahead of my first swimming lesson, when a fellow pupil turned to me and casually said, did you know black people can't swim? Their bodies are different, so it won't be easy for you today. I am of English and African heritage, so in that moment, with that one casual comment, not only did my excitement evaporate, but so did my belief that I would ever be able to swim. Needless to say, that swimming lesson did not go well, I flapped around like a drowning dog and ultimately gave up halfway through the lesson. It would take me 18 years, and someone credible convincing me that this wasn't true, for me to finally learn how to swim. A remarkable study published in 1995 used something called priming to demonstrate the effects that this type of stereotype threat can have on your self-story. Researchers gave a group of students a difficult vocabulary test, but before the test began, they asked some of the black students questions about their race. Astonishingly, the black students who were asked about their race performed worse on the test, scoring lower than both the white students and the black students who had not been questioned. Importantly, when students were not asked these questions, the scores were comparable. The insidious impact a negative stereotype can have on someone's self-story isn't just observed in matters of race. In another study, researchers wanted to test the pernicious myth that says women aren't as good at maths as men. Before setting both male and female undergraduates the test, some of the participants heard the researcher say that as a rule, men and women scored differently on this test, others were told that men and women had previously scored equally. The women who heard the researchers' negative comments performed significantly worse, reported greater anxiety and had lower expectations about their performance than the men. This experiment confirmed earlier studies by finding that when participants were exposed to a comment about their gender, a stereotype threat kicked in and their performance deteriorated. So, what would happen if a woman could escape her identity, change her self-story and pretend to be someone else while writing the test? A researcher called Shen Zhang set out to test this. Zhang gave 110 female undergraduates and 72 male undergraduates 30 multiple choice maths questions. Before the test, each of them was told that men do better at maths than women. In addition, some of the volunteers were then told to take the test under their real name, but others were to complete it under one of four invented names, Jacob Tyler, Scott Lyons, Jessica Peterson, or Caitlin Woods. The men outperformed the women in the test. But astoundingly, women who assumed an alias, whether it was male or female, outperformed the women who didn't. And, importantly, the women adopting an alias did just as well as the men. This demonstrated once and for all the merits of tests and interviews using alternative identification methods that avoided names, in the researchers' words, this would potentially allow stigmatized individuals to disconnect their self from a threatening situation, and crucially, disarm negative stereotypes. The Science of Developing a Strong Self-Story in Your Health, Work, and Life The self-story Chris Eubank Jr. was describing is a theory scientists and psychologists know well and refer to as your self-concept. It is our personal belief of who we are, encompassing all our thoughts and feelings about ourselves, physically, personally, and socially. It includes our beliefs about our capabilities, our potential and our competence. Your self-story develops most rapidly during early childhood and adolescence, but it continues to form and change as we collect more evidence about ourselves throughout our adult life. Your self-story creates mental toughness. Psychology professor Fatway Tentema states that individual resilience is influenced by having a positive self-story. Individuals with a positive self-story will be more optimistic, persevere for longer in the face of adversity, handle stress better and achieve their goals more easily. Individuals with a low self-concept will believe and view themselves as weak, incompetent, unwelcome, lose interest in life, be pessimistic about life and give up easily. Laura Polk, scientist and leadership expert. One study on students, conducted by E.K.A. Ariane, 
a scientist at Merkubuana University of Yogyakarta in Indonesia, sought to understand the relationship between self-story and resilience, and concluded that self-story is almost 40% of what makes a student mentally tough. The other 60% of factors that can affect individual resilience include actual abilities, family factors, and community factors. So how do we improve our self-story so that we can be resilient and optimistic, achieve our goals and persevere in the face of adversity? Creating a stronger self-story You've probably heard this quote by legendary college basketball coach John Wooden, the true test of a man's character is what he does when no one is watching. This is true, but according to science, it's also true that a person's character is created, built, or destroyed when no one is watching. Everything you do, with or without an audience, provides evidence to you about who you are and what you're capable of. As we discovered in Law 4, first-party evidence, that is, everything you observe with your own senses, is by far the strongest evidence when it comes to creating or changing a belief. You're in the gym alone lifting weights, you're on your last set and you've got to do 10 repetitions to complete the workout. You get to the ninth rep and your muscles are burning, what do you do? Your choice, in this moment, may seem inconsequential, but every decision we make writes another line of powerful first-party evidence, about who we are, how we respond to adversity and what we're capable of, into today's chapter of our self-story. That evidence will not only become self-fulfilling in the gym, it will permeate the rest of your life and relentlessly influence your behavior. That evidence will whisper to you when things are difficult, just drop the weight, just give up, remember. You can't do this, and science shows that in the face of adversity, negative self-evidence will cause you more stress, more worry, and more anxiety than a story full of perseverance, overcoming and victory. What we believe about ourselves creates our thoughts and feelings, our thoughts and feelings determine our actions, and our actions create our evidence. To create new evidence you must change your actions. Choose to do the 10th rep when it would be easier to stop at 9. Choose to have the difficult conversation when it would be easier to avoid it. Choose to ask the extra question when it would be easier to stay silent. Prove to yourself, in a thousand tiny ways, at every opportunity you get, that you have what it takes to overcome the challenges of life. And if you do, only then will you actually have what it takes to overcome the challenges of life, a robust, positive, evidence-based self-story. The law, never compromise your self-story. Mental toughness is required for enduring success, and it's principally derived from having a positive self-story. To build your self-story, you need evidence, and that evidence is derived from the choices you make in the face of adversity. Be wary of counter-evidence and the insidious long-term impact it can have on your self-belief and behavior. If an 8-year-old tells you that you can't swim, tell him to fuck off. The most convincing sign that someone will achieve new results in the future is new behavior in the present. Law 8. Never fight a bad habit. This law reveals some surprising truths about how to make and break any bad habit you have. It shows you why fighting bad habits is a failing strategy which often leads to rebounding, and what you should do instead. I grew up worrying that my dad was going to die. At some point before I turned 10, my siblings and I discovered that dad was a secret smoker, presumably he'd hidden it from us to stop us replicating his habit. But once we'd found his miniature cigars, he began smoking in front of us. Surprisingly to me, he only ever smoked in the car. Never at parties, never at home, never at work, only in the car. I made a few subtle attempts to get him to quit, but nothing worked. Until one day, ten years later, when I inadvertently led him to finally quit his 40-year habit. In order to explain what happened, I first need to briefly explain how habits are held in place. The concept of habit loops was introduced by Charles Duhigg in his book The Power of Habit, in which he explores how and why habits develop, why they stick and how we can break them. Simplified, a habit loop consists of three key elements. Q, the trigger for habitual behavior, example a stressful meeting or negative event. Routine, the habitual behavior, example smoking a cigarette or eating chocolate. Reward, the result slash impact on you of the habitual behavior. Example a feeling of relief or happiness. When I was 18 years old, after dropping out of university to build my first tech startup, I read a book called Hooked by Near Eyal. 
which explains how big social media companies and tech companies get their users addicted to their products by exploiting this habit loop. While I was reading the book, I happened to stop off at home, and accidentally left it in my dad's bathroom. My dad loves to read while he's on the toilet, and picked the book up. It taught him about his habit loop, and he finally understood the cue, his car, routine, reaching into the car door, grabbing the cigarettes and lighting one, and reward, nicotine creating a dopamine release in his brain, that were causing him to smoke. The next day he went to his car, took the cigarettes out, put miniature lollipops into the cigarette case, and never smoked again. The habit loop had been interrupted. A new, less addictive habit had taken its place, and with that my father's health outcomes had drastically improved. Whether my father realized it or not, the science shows that the most important thing he did was not trying to fight the habit, but replacing the final step of the habit loop with a much less addictive reward, the lollipops. Some incredible new scientific research has revealed just how foolish it is to try and fight your bad habits, and why people always seem to rebound when they do. Have you ever noticed that when you focus too much on stopping something, you ultimately end up rebounding and do it more? This is because we are action-oriented creatures, not inaction-oriented creatures. Taylor Shero, who we met in Law 3, said to me. To get something good in life, whether it's a chocolate cake or a promotion, we usually need to take action and do something to earn it. Consequently, our brain has adapted to understand that action is related to reward. So when we expect something good, a go signal is activated, which makes us more likely to act, and act fast. Shero describes an experiment where volunteers were told they could either press a button to get a reward, $1, or press a button to avoid a negative action, losing $1. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the volunteers who pressed the button to get the reward did so much more speedily than the volunteers who pressed the button not to lose the dollar. The brain associates rewards with action, so you need to pair an action with a reward. Additionally, some studies have shown that the more you try to suppress an action or thought, the more likely you are to take the action, or think about that thought. This is great evidence for the power of manifestation, you get what you think about, but it's also further evidence that trying to fight or not think about a habit is a foolish strategy. A 2008 study in Appetite found that the group of volunteers who tried not to think about eating ate more than the group who didn't. The first group exhibited what is called a behavioral rebound effect. Similarly, a 2010 study in Psychological Science found that the group of smokers who tried not to think about smoking actually thought about it even more than the group who didn't. This reminds me of a small piece of advice my driving instructor said to me when I was 18, Stephen, the car will go where your eyes are looking. If you want to avoid crashing into the cars on the side of the road, don't focus on the cars on the side of the road, because you will veer towards the parked cars on the side of the road. Look forwards, into the distance, where you want the car to go. This seems like a fitting analogy for breaking and making habits, you will end up doing the thing you're focusing on, so don't. Focus on stopping smoking, don't fight it, focus on the behavior you want to replace it with. The director of the University of Oregon's Social and Effective Neuroscience Laboratory, Elliot Berkman, says that if you're a smoker and you tell yourself not to smoke, your brain still hears smoke. Conversely, if you tell yourself to chew gum every time you want a cigarette, your brain has a more positive, action-orientated goal to focus on. This explains why those miniature lollipops caused my dad to quit smoking, he didn't just take the cigarettes out of his car door, he replaced them with a new action for his brain to focus on, sucking lollipops. If you want to break a habit, get some sleep. When do you sleep, is a question that I've been asked almost weekly for the last 10 years, by more interviewers, panel moderators, and journalists than I can remember. The implied assumption behind this question, which has always perplexed me, is that I can't have accomplished extensive professional success while also getting a sufficient amount of sleep. The truth is very much the opposite, I've always slept well. I don't allow any meeting, call or appointment to be scheduled before 11 am and I rarely use an alarm clock, because I've always known that sleep is the foundation of success, not an inhibitor of it. You're more likely to do the thing you don't want to do when you're stressed out, said Russell Paul Drack, a psychology professor at Stanford University i.e. you're more likely to search out a dopamine hit, in the form of sugar, processed food, shrugs, porn, or alcohol, if you're stressed. Therefore, 
one of the most important things you can do to make new habits stick, and perform enough repetitions in that early phase to make the neurons in your brain fire together and wire together, is keep your stress levels low, especially in that critical early phase while you are forming the new habit. One of the most effective things you can do is also the simplest, get a good night's sleep. Whatever you are trying to improve, from your social life to your smoking habit, sleep will help. If you're trying to get fit, getting enough sleep improves your speed, your strength, and your endurance. If you're trying to perform better at work, a lack of sleep will lead you to be less productive, and if you're a manager, less attentive, less focused, less cheerful and even less ethical. If you're trying to lose weight or eat more healthily, sleep deprivation will decrease leptin, the hormone that gives your body the signal that you are full. It also leads to a corresponding increase in ghrelin, known as the hunger hormone, which causes a surge in appetite and fat storage, and can lead to you making unhealthy food choices. So, if you want to break old habits and make new ones, forget all the complicated tips, tricks and hacks, and focus on the basics, you'll succeed if you feel good, if you're not overstressed and if you've had a good night's sleep. Do not take on more than one habit at a time. We all know that willpower is key to success, but until about 25 years ago we had a pretty simplistic view of it as a skill that, once developed, remains constant. This all changed when, during his PhD, Mark Muraven, now professor at the University at Albany, New York, argued that willpower appears to diminish the more we use it. In 1998, he conducted a now famous experiment. In his lab, he set up a bowl of radishes and a bowl of freshly baked cookies, then brought in two groups of people who were led to believe the experiment was about taste perception. The first group was told they could eat the cookies and ignore the radishes, while the other was asked to ignore the cookies and eat only the radishes. Five minutes into the experiment, a researcher entered the room and, after a 15-minute break, gave both groups a puzzle that was impossible to complete. The cookie eaters, with their unused reservoirs of willpower, were incredibly relaxed, and would continue to try and solve it over and over and over again, some of them for over half an hour. On average, the cookie eaters spent almost 19 minutes trying to solve the puzzle before giving up. The radish eaters, who'd had to restrain themselves from eating the delicious cookies, depleting their willpower, couldn't have behaved more differently. They became frustrated and expressed their annoyance. Some put their heads on the table hopelessly, others lost their temper and took against the entire thing, complaining it was a waste of their time. On average, the radish eaters worked for around 8 minutes, less than half the time the cookie eaters persevered for, before they gave up. Since the cookie-slash-radish study, several researchers have tested and proven willpower depletion, the idea that rather than willpower being simply a skill, it is more like a muscle and, as with any muscle in the body, it gets tired as it works harder. In one, participants who were asked not to think about certain things during a first experiment were unable to suppress laughter when the researcher tried to make them giggle. Another experiment asked subjects to watch a tearjerker without giving in to their emotions, in a subsequent test of something physical rather than something emotional, the subjects, just like the unfortunate radish eaters, gave up more quickly. So if the science here is correct, and willpower is a limited resource, it's obvious that the more pressure, restrictions, and strain you put on yourself while trying to make new habits and break old ones, the less chance you have of achieving them and the more chance you have of rebounding. Fighting habits is a bad idea, it will drain your willpower and increase your chances of yo-yoing back into the habit. This is why unsustainable crash diets do not work, anytime you feel like. You're depriving yourself of something that you really want, you nearly always fail. For instance, in a 2014 study, almost 40 percenter of people said they failed to keep their New Year's resolutions because their goal was too unsustainable or unrealistic, and 10 percenter said they failed because they had too many resolutions. This is why making sure your habits are small and achievable enough to be sustainable, without the need for major sacrifice, which will deplete your willpower reserves, is incredibly important. Rather than giving up every unwanted habit you have at the same time, you should aim to have fewer goals, which increases the likelihood that you will complete any of them. With too many big, unrealistic, sacrifice-centric goals, your willpower will be under too much strain, it will run out, you'll fail, and you'll rebound.
And this is also why so many psychologists and scientists have found that the best way to create a new habit isn't by fighting an old one or depriving yourself of rewards, which is counterproductive, it's by finding new rewards, healthier rewards, and less addictive rewards, but nonetheless making sure you are still rewarding yourself along the way. The law, never fight a bad habit. If you want to overcome a habit, do not fight against it. Work with your habit loop and use positive action to replace it. Do not take on more than one bad habit at once, the more you try and change, the less your chances of changing anything. While you are creating your new habit, make sure you take care of yourself and get as much sleep as you can. Sleep, lift, move, smile, laugh, listen, read, save, hydrate, fast, build, create. Your habits are your future. Law 9. Always prioritize your first foundation. This law makes the case that most of us have the wrong priorities, and it urges you to reprioritize your health, so that you can live long enough to enjoy all your other priorities. Warren Buffett, formerly the richest man on earth, sat in front of a small group of college students in Omaha, Nebraska, and gave them his most important piece of advice. When I was 16, I had just two things on my mind, girls and cars. I wasn't very good with girls. So I thought about cars. I thought about girls, too, but I had more luck with cars. Let's say that when I turned 16, a genie had appeared to me. And that genie said, I'm going to give you the car of your choice. It'll be here tomorrow morning with a big bow tied on it. Brand new. And it's all yours. Having heard all the genie stories, I would say, what's the catch? And the genie would answer, there's only one catch. This is the last car you are ever going to get in your life. So it's got to last a lifetime. If that had happened, I would have picked out a car, but, can you imagine, knowing it had to last a lifetime, what I would do with it? I would read the manual about five times. I would always keep it garaged. If there was the least little dent or scratch, I'd have it fixed right away because I wouldn't want it rusting. I would baby that car, because it would have to last a lifetime. This is exactly the position you are in concerning your mind and body. You only get one mind, and you only get one body. And it's got to last a lifetime. Now, it's very easy to let them ride for many years. But if you don't take care of that mind and that body, they'll be a wreck 40 years later, just like the car would be. It's what you do right now, today, that determines how your mind and body will operate 10, 20, and 30 years from now. You must take care of it. I spent the first 80 percenter of my life prioritizing work, girls, friends, family, my dog, and my material possessions. Until, that is, I was 27 years old, when I and the rest of the world watched a global virus called COVID-19 sweep through civilization, tragically killing more than 6 million people. Because of the privilege of my youth and the naivete that instilled, up until then, being healthy was something I took for granted. If I'm totally honest, I didn't care about my health, I cared about looking good, trying to get a six pack, but actually, being healthy, was something I'd fortunately never had to think about. I think the global pandemic was psychologically traumatic for most of us, but if there was a silver lining for me, it's that the trauma of those two years etched the unarguable truth into my mind that my health should in fact be my top priority. An international team of researchers announced that pooled data from scores of peer-reviewed papers capturing almost 400,000 COVID-19 patients found that people with obesity who contracted COVID-19 were 113 percent or more likely to fall so ill that they would need to be hospital at least. Unhealthy individuals were significantly more likely to die. I have a strong enduring belief that none of us actually believe we're going to die, this is so clearly evidenced by how we live our lives the petty things we worry about in our attitude to risk. However, COVID-19 brought death to my doorstep, I got to see death up close and all too personal for the first time in my life. I was able to ponder its terrifying, liberating, and uncertain features. Staring into the clarifying face of death, I could see how poorly I had prioritized my life. I could see that my work, my girlfriend, my friends, my dog, my family, and everything I owned were all just items placed on a fragile table called my health. Life could take any of those items off the table, as it often does, and I would still have everything else on the table. You could remove my dog, 
God forbid, and I'd still have everything else on the table, you could take my girlfriend off the table, and I would still have everything else, but if you removed the table, my health, everything falls to the floor. I would lose it all. Everything is contingent on the table. Everything is contingent on my health. My health is my first foundation. Therefore my health, logically, must be my first priority, every day, forever. And crucially, by embracing this reality, by having health as my first priority, my life is extended so I can enjoy all of my other priorities, my dog, my partner, my family, even more. There is no greater form of gratitude than taking care of yourself. This one realization changed the trajectory of my life, and for the past three years I have made radical dietary changes, cutting down sugar, processed food, and refined grains. I began exercising six days a week, without missing a week, and I have drastically increased my consumption of water, plants, and probiotics. I'm objectively healthy, which is great, but I also feel amazing, which is even better. The positive impact on every part of my life. My business, productivity, sleep, relationship, mood, sex life, confidence, has been so profound that I couldn't write this book without including taking care of your first foundation as an unavoidable law of greatness. Those who think they have no time for bodily exercise will sooner or later have to end time for illness. Edward Stanley The law, always prioritize your first foundation. Take care of your body, it is, after all, the only vehicle you get to own, the only vessel you'll use to explore the world and the only house you can ever truly call a home. Your health is your first foundation.